remember, please remember that when things get rough, you can always leave over there and come here to Sankofa Books and sit down and relax. Because this is the liberation space and the liberation zone. Malcolm's Love Supreme was by any means necessary. And it goes on, but it concludes with um, um, a, a very uh, prophetic state statement. And that is the strength of a nation is a mirror of the music of his people. I say the strength of a nation is a mirror of the music of his people. History has shown that the nation is strong when the music is strong. Black people cannot go wrong when the music is strong. And then the other piece, I'm just going to do some um, excerpts from how am I long for time? You're good. No. Okay. Um, you know, this information has to be transmitted intergenerationally. Our youth, I mean, you shouldn't have to stumble upon it like I did. Okay. That was at the time the, 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 the X movie wasn't out and the hats weren't there, you know, uh, none of the above. All I know is in the schools, I might hear about Martin Luther King back then, but I definitely wasn't going to hear anything about Malcolm X. So I wanted to change that uh, for the youth. So I went through his life. I basically took the autobiography, that's, you know, what I had at the time, and um, did this little uh, bit. Malcolm X was a strong black man. Malcolm X said the struggles for land, self-determination for black people now, by any means necessary was his vow. He was born Malcolm Little on the 19th day. 1925, the month was May. He was born up south in Omaha, Nebraska. Even before his birth, there was much disaster around his father's home. The clan did ride. Mama and children were alone inside. Because the very little was away that night, the clan got away without a fight. The family moved to Lansing, Michigan. Malcolm fought about a house, but there was violence again. Because Reverend Little organized for the UNIA. The clan burned it home one dreadful day. When Malcolm was six, he took a deep, long breath. It was whisper his father just been beat to death. Attacked by white racists and thrown across the tracks Cause he stood up for what Garvey talk about blacks The state broke up his home, drove his mama out of her mind She was sent to the hospital, her children were in a bind Now Malcolm being young and without parental guide He began to steal, he cheated and lied But at the state detention home where Malcolm was sent he made good grades and was class president. Then when asked in school what he wished to be, a lawyer, Malcolm said quite proudly. His teacher looked to him and said, you're out of your mind. A simpler type of work you had better find. Malcolm was discouraged. From that point on, lost interest in school and in eighth grade was gone. He traveled to Boston to live with his sister Ella, became a shoeshine boy and a hip slick fella. Malcolm learned how to hustle, how to make a quick buck, caught the train to Harlem and thought he found luck. At small paradise, he got a waiter's job. He met many gangsters and learned more ways to rob. Big Red was the nickname he was called because he had reddish brown hair and was six feet tall. Malcolm broke into houses late at night, stole clothes and jewelry, whatever he could say. Was caught by police and sent to jail. He was 20 years old but given no bail. At first in prison, Malcolm acted really mean. They called him Satan because he made an evil scene, but a few years later he took a long, curious look in the prison library and checked out a book. Malcolm had read a book since the eighth grade, but he copied down the words page after page that took the dim prison lights. While out in his cell, Malcolm read until his eyes were no longer well. He studied about Africa and its ancient glories. He studied about blacks and read many stories. He went through the dictionary, learned much knowledge. Later on, many would think he had been to college. 
while studying in prison, Malcolm wrote many letters. His brother often visited him to make him feel better. This brother spoke with pride about a religion he had embraced. He said that nation of Islam was for the black race. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad was the leader of the group. It uplifted black folk and taught them the truth. Now Malcolm listened closely to what his brother said. Many years had passed since he was called Big Red. He began to write Muhammad and the messenger wrote back. Elijah taught him facts about whites and blacks. He wrote him of devilish deeds by the racist white man about the tricks and the lies he spread throughout the land. Malcolm slowly thought back and remembered his past. Those who messed up his life hard and fast. The clan laid his paw across the tracks. The teacher who said a lawyer was not for blacks. The judge who sentenced him away to do time. The state which drove his mama out of her mind. That he must struggle against evil was now plain to see. Malcolm now knew what he wanted his life to be. So when Malcolm left jail in 1952, he changed his ways. He had work to do. He smoked no cigarettes, sold no dope, because being a Muslim gave him hope. Remember at his birth, his last name was Little, where his name came from. No longer was it riddle, twas a slave owner's name from long ago. So Malcolm used the X for the name he'd never know. Malcolm became a Muslim minister. Nation of Islam was at his peak. Malcolm founded new temples and the paper Muhammad speaks. He often talked on street corners and in the bars and to the hustlers with the fine Black as he caused, and he wrapped to black youth with respect in their eyes as he showed how integration was only slavery in disguise. Malcolm spoke of self-defense and independent land about human rights that blacks must be men. He became a great leader. Very busy was his life. He made fiery speeches now had children and a wife. But it was later found out that the vicious FBI joined black groups to destroy and spy. Soon the one strong movement became infiltrated. Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X were soon separated. So Malcolm traveled to Mecca and Ghana too, then came back to Harlem to found the OAAU. He said fighting for just civil rights would not let us rise to win our struggle internationalized. Just to hear this great black man made the people fascinated. But there were also those who wanted him assassinated. Very busy, Malcolm stayed as the months passed along. Although his life was now in danger, he kept on pushing on. But February 21st, 1965 was the last day Malcolm was to stay alive. About to make a speech, Malcolm faced his doom upon the stage of Harlem's Audubon Ball. Now in this audience were some men who did what whites willed. They aimed a shotgun and said Malcolm was killed. People mourned Malcolm's death all over this land. They loved him because they knew he was a strong black man. Since then his body is rested six feet underground, but across the black nation his spirit can be found. Though the vision Malcolm gave us was so very strong, his message can be found in my little song. Malcolm X was a strong black man. I can't say Malcolm X said the struggles for land, self-determination for black people now. By any means necessary was his vow. By any means necessary was his vow. That's what Malcolm means to me. Wow. It's an honor to be here. I would I don't think there's another place I'd rather be now than here. And thank you for your presence because you make this what's important to us. I want to thank members of the panel and Paul Coates and Haile Garima and Shirikiana and all the all those who work so hard at Sankofa to make this possible. It is more important for me to be at Sankofa than a, it is more important for me to be at Sankofa than to be at Busboys and Poets. Malcolm said, my whole life 
has been a chronicle of changes. My whole life has been a chronicle of changes. It has always been my belief that I too will die by violence. I have done all that I can to be prepared. How does one prepare for death by violence? How does one prepare from an early age, at two and three and, and, and throughout your entire life for that moment? How do we come close to those experiences? How do we ask ourselves as we walk down the street or as we listen to Paul Ropes and say, no more auction block for me? How do we live that? And how does that mean, how does that become significant in our lives when we will sell out our brothers, our people, our sisters, our family for anybody that produces the right amount of cash? Amen. How do we really mean no more auction block for me? Am I still for sale? Am I still a slave? For sale. Malcolm brought us to that point where he says, I am not for sale. Teach. And if it means that I have to face and confront death, which I can predetermine as he told us when he would die, he was able to deal with that. Now, I wonder how we look at John the Baptist. <laughs> A lot of us are Christians. I wonder how we look at our recent event in Pakistan, yeah. where death is predicted. Yes. Whether we celebrate or don't celebrate, what does it mean to prepare oneself for death? And the list goes on long, whether it is Dr. King, whether it is Walter Rodney, whether it is, it is Amilcar Cabral, whether it is Steve Biko, and it is a long, long list of those who have come to us and have prepared themselves for death. So we have to ask ourselves that, because the preparation comes essentially from our actions, from our decisions. And it is very obvious that Malcolm says that those of us who are educated, so does George Jackson, that those of us who are educated and advanced become more susceptible to selling out our people than anybody else. And they provide the bankruptcy of leadership that we are faced with today all over the African world. Malcolm will be in tears to see the leadership in Africa, the Caribbean, the United States of America, Canada, France, England, etc., because we seem to be following deeply into the footsteps of bankruptcy, of corruption, and of being corruptible. Mm -hmm. And Malcolm would have recognized that very easily in us. But there is no one speaking to that question today, how corrupt we have become. And we have passed it on to our children, whether it is the president of the IMF. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I haven't heard a voice, a single voice say that this man is corrupt. Others might have said it, but we don't say it. But I have heard people who have said and, and said that Malcolm and the Nation of Islam and Gavi and Walter and others are corrupt and speak to their deficiencies in ad hominem arguments, personal or otherwise. How can we do that? How much do we get? for that. Mm. 30 pieces of silver, 30 million dollars, 3 billion francs. What do we get to do that? And why is it necessary for us that we are trained from a very early age when the child does something wrong in school and the teacher says, who did that? We point to somebody else when we did it. <laughs> How is that part of our lives? So we learn, therefore, to confront our brother and destroy our brother, our sister, in order to do what? To protect the crumbs that Malcolm says we may get off the table. Right. How does that happen? And how does that leave our memory when we're acting? Malcolm talked about the pain that he had when his mother was, his father was assassinated and his mother was put in an insane asylum. 
And that, that pain continued to him because his uncles were also assassinated. Mm -hmm. And there are those of us who walk around today with no sense that my father could be assassinated. And the reason why we know we can't walk around with that is because my father is not saying anything mm -hmm. that will disrupt the status quo ante. Uh oh, that's right. That's right. My father is so accommodating to the existing <laughs> politics, to the existing reality, that he's not prepared to say this is wrong and this is right and take a position like Malcolm, like King, like Amilcar Cabral, like Biko, like Rodney, and the list goes on like Patrice Lumumba and say this is wrong. We are not prepared today to say anything is wrong because we've got to keep our J-O-B. We've got to put food on the table. We've got to make sure that our children survive in school. We've got to do all these things that accommodate us. And because we are terrorized on a daily basis by those who work for the state apparatus mm -hmm. called the CIA, the FBI, and et cetera, et cetera, who come into our midst and take back what we say mm -hmm. and betray us no different from Peter, from Judas, yes. and from all the others, yes. and Paul and others who did exactly that. We must come to grips with that. So that Malcolm talks about his mother and his father's death, but he's coming to grips with something that is very important to us in the 20th century and important to us in earlier periods, but we don't look at it very carefully. He talks about death at an early age. Death at an early age. He's expecting to die at a very early age. Now, we have accommodated ourselves to we shooting and killing each other in the streets at an early age, but we are not accommodating ourselves to political death at an early age. Not Steve Biko, not Cabral, not Fanon, not Malcolm, not Martin. We're not accommodating ourselves to that because that's not what we're talking about. We spend most of our conversations talking about the brother in Southeast. <laughs> Shooting another brother as we look at it on the news and talk about, look what black people have come to. Malcolm didn't engage in that. He said we were beyond that. We're somebody else. So death at an early age, whether it is, whether it is Charlie Christian, a musician, whether it is, it is, uh, uh, name any other musician? Charlie Parker. Charlie Parker, whoever it is. Just go on, the list goes on. Death at an early age. For those who speak out, and those who are prepared to protest and argue and, and, and redefine reality in the world that we live in. The next one is being put in an insane asylum. Whether it is Buddy Bowden, Buddy Bowden. whether it is Theolonus Monk, whether it is Mingus, whether it is Charlie Parker relaxing at Camarillo or Bellevue for you with Bud Powell, put in an insane asylum, whether it is Sterling Brown. And we forget that our people are put in insane asylums because they are considered to be crazy <coughs> for speaking the truth. And Malcolm, therefore, had to deal with that reality. He says, when I saw my mother when I saw my mother in the insane asylum after 20 years, I couldn't recognize her. I couldn't speak to her. I, I, I was in tears. I didn't know what to do because my mother had been put away because she, as a light-skinned black woman from Grenada, married a black, blue-black man from Mississippi who was a Garveyite when she could have chosen anybody else as a Caribbean person. And Caribbean people don't deal with that reality of Malcolm's mother. I want us to understand that, that that is one of the problems, because it, we don't even want to get close to Africa in terms of who we have relationships with, far less to do what Malcolm's mother did and raise these children. That's a real problem for us. Still is a problem in the age of 21st century reconstruction, where the mulattoes have taken over. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Malcolm was very clear about that, the role of the mulattoes in our history. We mustn't get away from that. So we have to deal with that. But we're blacker than thou. We're blacker than black. we blue, black, 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 blue, black, blue, black, black, black in Baltimore. That's who we are. 
People in Baltimore refer to you as black, black. They don't just say you're black, you're black, black. In order to make sure that, they, that you are defined by reality when they see you. I've, I've always been amazed at that when I go to Baltimore. Paul Coach notwithstanding. But it is very real for us. So Malcolm deals with that. And then Malcolm deals with not only death at an early age, and not only, and not only insane asylum, but he deals with jail. Those of us who protest, those of us who argue, those of us who say that the, the society, that capitalism is bankrupt, that, that, that our social matrix has nowhere to go, those people end up in jail. Understand that. And they say, like George Jackson and Malcolm, when I go to jail, that's when I begin to study. Well, that is a very fascinating question for us. I have a list of 99 books that George Jackson had in his room that he studied and reread and so on. And I guarantee you that nobody in this room, uh, including myself, had, have read 25% of those books. Damn incredible, I have the list, I can show you. We haven't read them. And suddenly our children haven't learned 1% of those books. That's what makes it even frightening, because those books are not used at Howard or UMBC or Harvard or Princeton or Hampton. And they're not complicated books, you know, they're very simple books that we, we all should read. They're all in, in, they're in this building, in this building here. All of those books are here. But we haven't read them, because we really don't have the desire to read them. We would rather look at television, <laughs> or we would rather be recolonized by consumerism. So we have the cell phones and we would rather send text messages than read and study like Malcolm and George said. And they said, we studied and they aren't the only ones either. So jail becomes another issue for us. And Malcolm had to live with that. We spend all our lives telling our children we don't want them to go to jail and we don't want them to mix with people in jail and we don't want them to go in, in jail and teach and help. And we, we want to keep them away from that because they, they represent the worst of the worst. But they produced a Malcolm. How come? He says that's where he found it. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you just go to jail, <laughs> but I'm saying, oh gosh, why should we be so disposed? about this experience of jail when it is an essential part of our historical reality and some of the best minds have come out of that experience. Why should we respect those minds? But you see, if we dismiss jail, then we dismiss Malcolm mm. in, an, in a very interesting and indirect way. Mm. In other words, it helps us also to dismiss Malcolm. And it helps those of us who are ac academics and intellectuals to dismiss Malcolm. Uh -oh. mm -hmm. Because there is a difference between going to jail and going to Harvard. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a difference between going to jail and going to Hampton. Mm -hmm. Do you understand that? So we dismiss them as not being relevant and important. Whatever they said cannot, doesn't make any sense. And there we are. And if we go around the world, we find the same issue. Whether it is in Krumah or Lumumba, whether it's Gandhi or... Nehru, whoever it is, but we have a concept now, and therefore our preoccupation with going to jail now is a, a way of escaping the reality of what jail means at this point in time. The last one is exile. We all go into exile, whether it's James Baldwin, Richard Wright, everybody, I am an exile. We all have no country, no place that we belong to. And therefore I ask myself, couldn't Martin and Malcolm and others have gone into exile into Africa, or did they have to stay here to die? Mm -hmm. And if they predicted their deaths, was that an act of suicide? Mm -hmm. If you predict your death and you walk straight into death, did John the Baptist com commit suicide? Did Malcolm commit suicide? Because in the 21st century, suicide is a different kind of problem. In the 20th century and the 19th century, when you commit suicide, you go straight to hell. You don't even go to purgatory like a Catholic like me. You know, I'm a Catholic, I got a chance in purgatory. You, know, uh, yes. you go straight to hell. Straight to hell. And after you've done that. But in this new, in this new, in this new dispensation, people are saying you commit suicide and you go straight to Allah. <laughs> How do we reconcile that in Christian orthodoxy, where most of us are? members of Christian orthodoxy. What then does suicide mean? And how do exile people deal with that? Is it easier for us 
to live in Washington DC and New York and Chicago than it is for us to live in the Congo mm. or Cameroons yes, or Ethiopia. Is it easier? Or Trinidad or Jamaica? Is it easier? We have to answer that question. And Malcolm made, made up his mind. He said, look, I am not going to stay in exile. They offered him opportunities to stay in Africa, to stay in the Middle East. And he said, no, I'm coming back. To do what? To deal with my fate and my faith. Mm -hmm. Two very interesting words, F-A-T-E and F-A-I-T-H. I have faith in my fate, and my fate determines my fate. How do I do that? Is Malcolm playing games with us or with himself or with others? But we're preoccupied with the split between Malcolm and the nation when there are much more important things. This is a man that felt very passionately that his moral life had a very important relationship to his political life. Now that is not very easy for most of us. Because if we live, we live in an immoral society, and we don't have to turn to the governor of South Carolina, or we don't have to turn to whoever it is we want to turn to. If we live in an immoral society, how do we then ask people who live in an immoral society to be moral? It becomes, it becomes almost impossible. And how do we define that morality? Do we, find, do, do we define it only in terms of our political interests? So that our leader could receive a Nobel Prize and make a speech on behalf of the validity and the significance of war. <laughs> it's unbelievable contradictions. And I say, if Malcolm was alive, I could imagine how we would have taken that language and what you would have. How do you receive a peace prize and then give a justification for just war? That is awesome. And therefore, we cannot, we cannot claim that we, we, we remember Malcolm and we, we love Malcolm and we feel Malcolm and these things happen right in front of us and we don't deal with them. We say, well, I'm not going to deal with that, you know. If the man give a speech, that's his business. You get a Nobel Prize, I'm glad for him. <laughs> what else? Get some money, too. That's nice. Yeah. I wish he would send some for me, too. <laughs> but but, 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 but where, is the, where is the discourse? Where is the dialogue around war and the validity of war? Where is the discourse? Malcolm is deeply immersed in our foreign policy and prepared not only to speak about foreign policy in Harlem and the Harlems of the USA, but prepared to go to Cairo and make a speech in Cairo. And we don't even know the speech Malcolm made in Cairo before the Organization of African Unity. I know you wrote that speech. I know you got it. Yeah, you wrote it. You understand that? I'm saying that those speeches are no longer made. So it means that we have to go back, those of us who claim Malcolm, and read those speeches again and ask, what was he saying? Mm -hmm. We can't just like Malcolm because he was cute. Mm -hmm. We can't like Malcolm because, okay, because he was hip or cool, as the young people would say, everything is cool. But we got to like Malcolm because we know what Malcolm said. We know what Malcolm stood for. We know what he believed in. We've got to go deep inside and make sure that our children, our grandchildren, and everyone else have some sense of the dignity of this man, his very essence, his sense of being, and his, 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 his sense of responsibility, not only to the past, but to the present and the future. Because it is in Malcolm, and the changes in Malcolm, that demand certain changes in us. Mm -hmm. We are not ready. That's why we have been pushed back so far in our revolutionary pursuits. We're not ready because we've chosen not to be ready. We've chosen not to get ready because it is too dangerous. Mm -hmm. And we have been inundated with fear, yes. with a certain kind of fear that is exactly at the same level of the terror that we existed, that existed in the 18th century in the 19th century and in the early part of the 20th century, a terror that deepens in our consciousness and never allows us to say, I am, therefore we exist. Thank you very much.
Good evening, and uh, I also want to thank uh, thank the uh, Sankofa for having this event this evening. Uh, I am a member of the, uh, I was elected in January as a member of the Board of Directors of the Malcolm X Betty Shabazz Center in, uh, in New York, which is there in the space that was the old Audubon Ballroom. Oh, wow. In fact, the part that makes up the center is actually where the stage was. Mm -hmm. It's very weird to go to that place and be in that space and know that you're, you're that the stage is no longer there, but this the part of the building that became the center in, is the part where the stage was, uh, where he was assassinated. Uh, and uh, but I decided that I was going to come here tonight rather than go up to New York to to the uh, event there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What Brother Malcolm meant to me was uh, is a concept that I developed in 1985 when I began to first uh, get speaking engagements to speak at colleges and universities about him. And I was trying to figure out a way to make him real talking to students. Uh, at the time, uh, well not at that time, but before that I had been an associate director of the Black Theater Alliance. The Black Theater Alliance was an umbrella organization of about 60 uh, black theater and dance companies around the country, of course, most of them being in New York City. I lived in New York City from 1962 to uh, 1986 in Harlem. And I always noticed that the dance community, uh, the top dancers, people who we considered master dancers, if a Catherine Dunham or a Pearl Primus or a Tally Beattie was in town and doing a workshop, these dancers who we thought were at the absolute top of their uh, field would rush to take those classes. They call them master dance classes. And it was from that that I developed the concept that to me, Brother Malcolm was and is a master teacher. Yeah. And there's no more important member of any community than a master teacher. Mm. Now I got this on a, on a very, First time I recognized this, although I did not have the concept at the time, was the very first time I heard him speak. It was the summer of 1962. I had just moved to Harlem. I moved, and believe me, I moved to Harlem grudgingly, <laughs> only because a friend of mine's mother had a boyfriend who had to go to Arizona because of his health, and he lived in an apartment on 142nd Street had eight rooms for $56 a month. Whoa. <laughs> I said, for a rent like that, boy, I'll take my chances in Harlem. I, I, I had very negative attitude about Harlem at that time. So I moved in on a Friday night, and that's, that's, that Saturday, my roommate and I decided to walk down Lenox Avenue, uh, Malcolm, which is now Malcolm X Boulevard. And we got to 116th Street and saw a crowd gathering. And when we asked what's going on, they said, Malcolm X is going to speak. That's where the mosque was, mosque number seven. So we said, let's, we, we, at that time, we had heard of him vaguely, usually boogeyman type things, you know, hated white folks, white devils, white, all white people were devils, and you know, that, that's what we had heard about him. So we stopped and got involved in the crowd, and he spoke for about three hours, very hot that afternoon. And the thing that I learned immediately from that speech was that we he said that we're not up against George Wallace and Senator Eastland and Bull Connor and those boys. We are up against a system of white supremacy. Amen. And we have to look at it that way. The civil rights, the traditional civil rights movement gave the impression, I think they did it unintentionally, that if you got rid of George Wallace and Mm -hmm. in East London and, mm -hmm. and some of the clans, a few people like that, then everything was going to be cool. Mm -hmm. Brother Malcolm said, no. We live in a system, a society that, uh, under which there's a system of white supremacy. That changed my, that immediately changed my way of looking at things. Because I had never thought about it like that. I was 24 years old. I had been, been a part of the civil rights movement. I had my first political activism at Howard University. I was a student there when the Greensboro sit-ins occurred. And we used to pick at the Woolworths at 14th and, 14th and Irving Street, I think it was. We used to pick at that Woolworths to show our support for the brothers who was 
picketing down in, who was sitting in down in, uh, in Greensboro, North Carolina. That was my first uh, political activism. So I've been a part of the, of the traditional civil rights movement. And after that, I became an, an instant Malcolmite. I began to, wherever he spoke in the New York City area, I would go to listen. And the more I, the more I listened, the more I learned. When he mentioned books, we would go try to find the books. He mentioned the article, we tried to read the article. And, and, and this is the way it went. I couldn't, get, couldn't be involved with him because I, I was not prepared to become a Muslim. And at that time, you had to be a member of the Nation of Islam to have any kind of real serious involvement with him. And I was, you know, had, I had kind of just dropped Christianity you know, as a religion, and I was not ready to go into another religion. So, so, I, so I said, I will, I have no way I'm going to become a Muslim. Plus, even though I had dropped Christianity, I love gospel music. Now, I used to tell my Muslim friends that when y'all don't have gospel music, so that's, that's that kind of leaves me out. But, uh, but he, uh, and I would, everywhere he went in the New York metropolitan area, I would be there listening. And then one day in, in early January 1964, a friend of mine who was almost a quintessential AKA lady, and we just, we, we, I, she worked right across the street from me, we would have breakfast together. And one day she, she said to me, you want to be a member of a new organization, me form a black nationalist organization. Well, when she said black nationalist, I was shocked. Because, you know, I, like I said, she looked like Miss AKA of the year. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, uh, and that's the way I always regarded her, you know. Very, very, she worked at NBC as an associate producer at, at NBC, you know. And so I just knew this, you know, I never said anything, but I just figured that, you know, like she was very much the, uh, oh, okay. And she was very much, you know, a part of the, you know, the whole, so she said that I was shocked. She said, "Don't ask me no questions. Just I'll call you on Saturday morning at eight o'clock and tell you where to be and and what I'll, I'll call you Saturday morning at eight o'clock. Tell you what time and where to be." Saturday morning she called, told me to go, go to this motel on 153rd Street and Eighth Avenue. Now that motel had a had a reputation as being what they call a hot sheets motel. Oh, oh you could get rooms for for two hours. <laughs> and so I was kind of surprised when she told me that we were going to be having this black nationalist uh, organization meeting in this place. But I was there on time. Uh, when I walked in I saw Dr. John Henry Clark, uh, John Oliver Killings and a couple other people that I recognized. Um, there was maybe about 10 people there. And I've been there about 20 minutes. Still, I have no idea. About 20 minutes later, Brother Malcolm walks in with about four uh, of his aides. And I mean, I literally almost fell off my seat. I had no idea that this is what this was going to be. And that's when we began the formation of the Organization of Afro American Unity. Mm -hmm. So I said in on the, and again, as I said in on the, listen, I saw him as a teacher. Because he was teaching us, we were, we were. He was teaching us, and we were sitting there and, and listening. And, but we were part of the conversation. He encouraged us to talk. He was also a great listener, and 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 a, and a great leader has to be also a great listener. He would listen to what everybody was saying. And the organization was announced publicly in June of 1964. We met from January to June. And then it was announced publicly in June of 1964. Now, he was not around most much of the time because he was too busy carrying out his foreign. He had a we OAAU. I think we were the only black organization in the country at that time that had a foreign policy. He was on. He had a goal of taking the United States government before the UN Commission on Human Rights for violating, for quote unquote, being unable or unwilling to protect the lives and property of black people. That was his, that was the, the foreign policy goal. And he worked on that. And, and he was traveling a lot. And, and during that time, I had, uh, when everybody was volunteering to, to work on certain committees and do certain things, when it was my turn, the only thing left was the newsletter. Now I had no journalism. I barely knew what journalism was at that time. But I ended up volunteering to be the editor of the newsletter because he always insisted that you must have, an organization must have its own, in, own instrument for getting information out. I volunteered to do the newsletter and that became my introduction to journalism. 
uh, I was the editor of the newsletter, which the first edition was called the OAAU Newsletter, then it became the, the Blacklash. And we named it that because there was a lot of talk about the white backlash. Yeah. So we decided to call our newsletter the Blacklash. Black That's how I got its name. The first article I ever wrote was about the killing of 15-year-old James Powell by that cop in Harlem that had launched the Harlem Uprising in 1964. That was the first article I wrote. I was the first person to reach the students who had been with the young man when he was killed by this policeman. And it was also there, again, that I learned from the master teacher. Because when he, he would call us from Cairo to get an update on what was happening you know, in the streets in terms of the uprising. So when it was my turn to speak with him, I read what I had written, and I said, eyewitnesses to the murder. And he stopped me. He said, no, Brother Peter, you can't call it a murder. Because murder and murderer are legal terms. <laughs> and when, not if, when he is acquitted, he can sue you for defamation of character. He said, call him a killer and refer to it as a killing. Because he's a killer, and it's a killing, no matter what the circumstances. That's the master teacher in action. Sure enough, I I have a copy of that work here with me. I'll show you. I did, we had you know we had the old fashioned mimeograph machine. We had already run off about six hundred copies of these things. So rather than go back and rerun them, I sat down and scratched out the word murder and wrote killing at the top above it. And I still have that. I have a copy of that uh, with me uh, tonight. And sure enough, when Gilligan was acquitted. He sued Martin Luther King's organization and James Farmer's organization for putting out information referring to him as a murderer. Wow. That was the master teacher in action. The master teacher also taught us, which is why those of us involved with Brother Malcolm never got put in jail for what we said. Because he told us that we have a meeting, a public meeting, and if anybody in that meeting stands up and says we ought to go bomb the subways, stop the meeting and put them out. Because nine times out of ten, they were provocative to mm -hmm. Sit there. Mm -hmm. And if you have a, even a five-second discussion mm -hmm. of what he said, everybody can be picked up for conspiracy. And though they have a very weak case, they can keep you tied up in the courts for two or three years, using all your time, energy, and resources trying to stay out of jail. Mm -hmm. So we learned that, again, learning from the master teacher. I mean, the man uh, gave myself and others like, my, like me those, those members of the OAAU, that's, we were all those, we were all people, you know, who, who, who believed in him and who supported him uh, uh, politically, economically, and culturally. The Muslim Mosque and Corporate were, were for those people who followed him from a religious uh, perspective. I remember when, in 1963, when uh, we had a rally around the killing of the little girls in Birmingham. And you, and you know how long ago it was, because the, the, the act at the Apollo that, that we, was Eartha Kitt. So you know if Eartha Kitt was at the Apollo Theater, we're talking like a long time. <laughs> but she was at the Apollo Theater. And Jackie Robinson had pulled this event together. And Brother Malcolm spoke first. It was a, had a flat truck. A big crowd in the streets. And he, they were, it was the first time I think that I saw him where he expressed serious anger. I mean, he was angry at the killing of those and the frustration of nothing happening. Uh, behind the killing of those little girls. And uh, when he finished speaking, he stepped down. That was a chock full of nuts on the corner of where uh, 125th Street and uh, 7th Avenue, which is now Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Boulevard. And chock full of nuts, for those of you too young to remember, was the Starbucks of right, the day. Right. Where, where, where you all consider Starbucks, now we consider chock full of nuts. Right. Uh, and that was what it was in those days. And Jackie Robinson, of course, they had a big executive position with Chock Full of Nuts. But I was kind of leaning up against the Chock Full of Nuts window, just watching the action. And Brother Malcolm and his, his, his and the Muslims with him, because he was in Steel Nation then, they came, and he was about six people from me. When Eartha Kitt came to speak, the, the people around Brother Malcolm began booing. They began booing her, and really would not let her speak. So I said, you know, I said to no one in particular, because at this time I had not met him. I said, I wonder why they're booing her. And he heard me. He looked down at me and said, because she doesn't like black men. 
Oh. And what had happened, she had written one of those articles in Ebony Magazine about the 10 most fascinating men I know or something like that. And not one of them was black. Oh, no. And that's why they were going for And again, this was the first time I saw his ability and, his, and how people responded to him. When the last speaker spoke, they said, the rally is over. The crowd said, no, we want to hear Malcolm X again. So they started, you know, we want Malcolm, we want Malcolm jumping up and down and stopping cars. And Jackie Robinson, you know, they paid him no mind at all. <laughs> and Brother Malcolm got back up on the platform and said, no brothers and sisters, you know, uh, we, we had a rally, now it's time to go home. And everybody went right off, right off. Nobody said where everybody left. The place was cleared in about two minutes. That was the first time I saw, personally saw, how people responded to him. And they responded to him because he had integrity. Yes. And you knew that when he that his that he loved black people, he would criticize. I mean, he could say some harsh things, but but it was from I guess what they nowadays call tough love. Tough love. It was kind of like the tough love approach, and uh, so I learned and I listened and I watched and I absorbed as much as I could of what he was saying, what he was doing. Most people don't know. That at that conference in 1964, I was telling uh, uh, Ackland, I have a copy right here of the speech that he made at that conference. And as a result of that speech that he made, the, Af the OAU made, issued a resolution. And I know this was unprecedented. They issued a resolution condemning racism in the United States. Mm. I have a copy of the resolution here. And our newsletter is probably the only publication in the United States that published that resolution. Nobody else published it. It's like they do now. All these people write all these books. But they don't talk about what he, that international thing he was doing. In, 19, in December 1964, Again, because of groundwork that he had laid, when they had the debate on the, in the Congo, on the Congo in the United Nations, where the United States, I think it was France and Belgium, England and Belgium, had gone into the Congo claiming that they had to go in there to save uh, these white nuns, you know, from these African quote unquote savages. When they during the UN debate, and I have copies of that statement, two African diplomats. For the first time in history, and I don't think it has happened since then. Mm -hmm. I don't think the, 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 the UN ambassador from Guinea and the UN ambassador from Ghana, they basically said, if the United States says that it has the right to intervene militarily in the Congo to save those nuns, who's to say that we don't have a right to provide military assistance to the black folks in Mississippi? All right. Amen. That was unheard of. Oh, right. Sorry. that was unheard of. <laughs> Oh, what they basically, I'm kind of paraphrasing now, but what they basically said was, if the United States says it has the, says it has the right to intervene military in the Congo to save those white nuns, then who's to say that we don't have the right to intervene military in Mississippi to protect black people who are being killed in Mississippi? Mm -hmm. That was unheard. This was December 1964. And I can imagine... Diego Hoover and those boys saying, that's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. This man's got to go. Yeah. Because the, uh, the newspaper article say that the, U, the U.S. diplomat, Adlai Stevenson, was the UN, UN, US, United States UN uh, representative then, said they were astounded by those African ambassadors making that connection. It never happened before. And I don't think it has happened since. I was lucky enough one time he took about six of us to, he, had, he was invited to the Tanzanian mission to the UN to a reception. And he took six of us with I was lucky enough to be one of the six. And as a result of that, one of the speakers at our rally became Mohammed Babu, who was one of the great leaders of, from Tanzania. He spoke at, our, one, at our, one of our rallies. I, have, I, have, I don't know how I got it, but I have the speech that, 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 represented, I mean, that uh, Ambassador Babu made. With, with his corrections in it. You know, I was, 
you know, I got serious about this journalism thing, man. I began to bug Brother Malcolm when he was back. I said, Brother Malcolm, you need to write a letter for the news, an article for the newsletter. And so on February 20th, mm. 1965, mm. he came by our office in the Hotel Teresa, and he gave me an article for the next issue of the mm. newsletter. And of course, he was assassinated the next day. No, the newsletter came out. Mm. But I still have that article. And in that article, he said, again, the teacher, he was talking about the importance of black people connecting with Africa. And, and although it was emotional, he gave a very practical uh, a reason for having that position. He said that when I was a child, people used to say, you don't have a Chinaman's chance. <laughs> Which means you didn't have a chance in the world to do whatever you were trying to do. He said, well, they don't say that no more sure now that China is a force that's on right. the world scene. That's right. He said, well, that's what Africa has to be for us. We have to reach the point in our connection of people of Africa and sit around the world that when, if, if anybody messes with people, the, the continent of Africa will be strong enough to make sure that don't happen. Mm -hmm. That's why he was, uh, besides the emotional, psychological reasons, that's why he was so, it was so important for him to do that. And he would believe that it was so important. The second thing he did, when he said that people often accuse me of, of not believing in progress. You know, it, 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 you know, they were talking about how much progress it had made and all this progress. He said, well, when you have a master-servant relationship <laughs> and the master's making $100 a month and you're making $10 a month, if the master starts making $1,000 a month, your situation is going to prove a little bit. He said, but that's not progress. Mm -hmm. Progress is when the master-servant relationship changes. Mm -hmm. And that has not happened. Mm -hmm. So that's why I don't go around, basically go around, you know, talking about how much progress has been made. Mm -hmm. Those are two things that are in that article wow. that he gave me on February the 20th, mm -hmm. uh, 1965. Mm -hmm. He was a brilliant man. Mm -hmm. And I will close by saying the other thing that he did for me personally, and I think for all the rest of us, uh, both, both uh, the young brother and everybody has kind of mentioned that. He was the first person I heard who talked about the psychological assaults of white supremacy in the same breath as the physical assaults. Mm -hmm. The civil rights organization basically talked about the, you know, the lynchings, the beatings, the brutalities. Mm -hmm. Brother Malcolm talked about those, but he was the first person I heard who talked about the constant psychological assaults. And I remember him saying that, you know, uh, about the enslavement uh, of our people. He said people always talk about the slave trader and the slave owner. He said, but they leave out a very important person. And that was the person that he described as the slave maker. And it was this person's job to take a people who had traditions, culture, history, and break them down psychologically. So the slavery became economically viable. Because if you have people who do, you don't do that, and you have, you might take, have 50 people enslaved, you might need 20 overseers to watch them. But if you can break them down properly, then you can do it with two overseers, and you can make much more money without having to pay those other 18 people. He was the first person I heard you know, talk about that. I'm not going to say nobody else ever did it. I say it was perfect. I heard put so much emphasis on the psychological. And as we all know, while the, the physical assaults have been significantly reduced, the psychological assaults are relentless. And as relentless as ever, they have not ceased for one single second. They go on every single day on television and movies. I just saw something, an ad uh, on, on, on the television, they've been showing quite a bit for about the last couple of weeks, from Intel, this, this corporation called Intel, where they are encouraging young people, you know, going into the science and, and math. And they have an Indian looking, a young man look like he's from India, uh, someone looks like they're from China, uh, someone looks like they're from you know, <laughs> European descent. And, and each one of them, says why he or she 
if you're going into science. They flash a photograph of a young black man, and all he does is smile. He doesn't say a word. That's on this Intel commercial that is running right now. He does not say one word. Everybody else. They just show it, he's there, he's got this big smile on his face and doesn't say a single word. But everybody else talks about why they are glad that Intel is providing this you know, opportunity for them to, to study science. Brother Malcolm taught us how to be aware of that and how we must be as, as, as conscious of combating the psychological attacks of white supremacy as we are in combating the physical attacks. And I think it's very difficult to convince our people of that. They simply, mm -hmm. you know, my, a lot of my friends don't want to go to the movies with me because when I go to the movies, I'm, I'm analyzing everything. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't want to go. But that's, that's, that's why I refer to him as a master teacher. Because he taught us, and as I said before, there's no more important member of any community than a master teacher. to do on the one hand was to um, shape a perspective and give a context to a discussion on Malcolm. And the other thing we wanted to do is have a discussion that's interactive. We also want to have, and I, I think I'll start that off by asking the panel some questions, but we also want to have a, a session that speaks to how Malcolm is being interpreted today. Now, Ackman, what do we want to do? You, you, can I ask the question about the book at this point, or do we want do we want to uh, take questions from the audience? <laughs> okay, Ackman says take questions from the audience. Will somebody ask about uh, the new Manny Maribel book? <laughs> <laughs> Look, okay. Okay, okay. This is, this is what the newsletter looked like. This, this was the last issue. Issue number nine. Here is the only thing I will ask you. We, we just had the long presentations on who Malcolm is. Like, because we had so many people, there's no way that we can do that from the floor. Okay? So I would ask that. Yeah, I mean, you can make statements of who Malcolm is. We don't. We we absolutely want that, but please do not make extended statements, okay? Because there'll be folks on the floor that'll tap you or something like that, or else I'll walk back to you. Uh, but we want to have a discussion going on more so than having our experts. We got experts up here, okay? Um, so from the floor, uh, the panel's opinion about the book. Aside from those one or two seemingly to me trivial issues that don't really destroy the person who Malcolm X was for me. Okay, could everybody hear that? Yes. Okay, the brother's really asking how, asking the panel to respond to um, Manny Marable's book beyond the trivial accusations, or if, if, if I can say that about your question, what, what he's referring to as trivial accusations about sexuality, about infidelity. He wants, uh, most of the reviews that have been done that he's seen has been negative. How does the panel feel about that? Does that capture your question? Um, let me just say first, to me it's difficult to separate the two because if you look at the, what I consider innuendo, the lack of uh, substantiation, and et cetera, et cetera, on one part, then you might want to question, in my mind, other parts as well. To me, what was the purpose? I mean, I'm just saying, I personally could care less about, 
a lot of those things that he inundated, okay, without even, I mean, he would set you up, but then doesn't even substantiate it. Okay, but that's, that's one thing. But then the other thing, what I was surprised I didn't see more of, particularly since it was supposed to have been such an in-depth study and view and all like that, I would like to have seen some of those much more than what was in there, those FBI documents. They would show more in context just the, the just the level of surveillance and 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 uh, and all like that that was going on by the FBI. And I will say one thing: if all of that was going on, I can assure you it would have been in FBI documents. Not only in FBI documents, if th th they would have been spreading those rumors yeah. back then at that mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. because they would have done anything. They were looking for anything, right. okay, to be able to destroy and split. Um, 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 the movement. Now, maybe it's, I don't know the extent of the COINTELPRO with respect to Malcolm in terms of what's available now, what's not uh, available. But I know in terms of the documents that I have seen dealing with other movements that came just shortly after Malcolm, those just before Malcolm, there was enough to be able to have put more things in context with respect to just you know, what all was going on and around. So I, I just wanted to just suffice by saying, I don't think you can really um, separate the two myself. Somebody else want to read? Well, I, I can't really, I've not, I have not read the book. I'm about halfway through the first chapter. I read the prologue. But of course, I've had at least a dozen people have called me and read me sections from the book. <laughs> uh, uh, and of course, with a couple of them about the section of the charges of, of this uh, sexual orientation. And my, my point that I have on that, without having read the book, is that I feel certain that if, if uh, the CIA, the FBI, and other Malcolm haters had that information, then he would not have, they would not have had to have him assassinated. Mm. You know, because they would have been able to wipe him right off the map by putting that out into the public. Mm -hmm. So uh, the fact that, that that did not happen makes me a little bit, uh, you know, wary of, uh, and the other thing I know about this book, I have a friend who's a professor over at Howard who's read it, and he said he has never seen a book with so many perhaps and and uh, where probably's and, and uh, may may you know in his life. That's supposed to be a book of scholarship, right. you know. So I started reading it last Sunday, and I hope to have it read, you know, in the next couple of weeks. Can I just interject one thing? Uh, and I agree with you that the that the author makes a lot of. Uh, um, he extrapolates far too much for me, and I'm not a, a scholar of that degree. But again, I don't, for me, I didn't care, well, I, well, yeah, I care about whether the fact it was true that Malcolm X had a homosexual relationship, whether that, if that was a complete fabrication, of course I cared. But for me, from my perspective, I was like, whatever with that when I was reading it. I, I, I was reading more into, the, you know, at least the specifics that I didn't know about his life, about, you know, his mother going into an insane asylum, his house getting firebombed. Is, is trip in Africa, the daily information that was going on one by one. Okay, yeah, and I understand. Okay. Right. Yeah. The panel is still responding. Do you want to respond to it? I just, uh, <laughs> I'm going to kind of split the difference here. I don't, how old are you? I'm just curious. I'm 45. Okay, all right. Uh, and I'm only asking because, you know, I got to be honest, I actually had a very similar reaction to you. And I, to be quite honest, I was wondering whether it was because we see different things. Like I didn't, I didn't really care. Like it didn't really affect how I felt about Malcolm X and the things that I value in Malcolm X are kind of irrelevant to whether he slept with a man or not. I mean, I'm just being straight about that. Having said that, I think you know my co-panelists raise a good point about substantiation in the book, and I think that's a huge, huge problem. Uh, and I wish that was better. You know, but in terms of what you said, I, I did. I felt very much the same way. You know, I, I just it just didn't have much to do with the value that I put on my own. Peter is about in the first chapter. I'm about halfway, and the reason why I'm halfway, I've had the book for a month. The reason why I'm halfway is because it's very hard. It's very difficult. I think it is important. Tell me, how can I split the difference on this one? I think it's very important if you put something like that, not only perhaps, maybes, but other suppositions in and you don't support them, then it goes to the heart of the book. Yeah. It goes to the whole belief, not, not, just that, not just that accusation, 
So I have to read very, very carefully, much slower than any other book that I'm reading. I have to mark up this book. And I told Tana House this, I've never marked up a book in my life because I believe books are sacred. That book is thoroughly marked, okay? And I'm just going to cool on it right there and let that uh, do his. I'll come right back to you, brother. Okay. I had promised not to talk about this book. <laughs> but you put it on the table, so let's deal with it. <laughs> Firstly, I, I, I think you're a master teacher, sir, so I'm just. Well, and I don't have to talk then. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Apple. Come on. I don't need that. I don't need what you just said. Okay, go ahead. I don't need it at all, at all, at all. So don't try to do that to me. Stay with your question and keep quiet. Keep quiet and let us talk. You, you, had, you talk twice. All right. And, 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 I'm, and I'm, I say that for a 45 year old man who raises a simplistic question based on the fact that he couldn't care less about these things said about Malcolm. I, I, I'm, I'm very disturbed about that. That's why I'm going to talk. Firstly, the book was researched and done over a period of 10 years. 10 years, and it is a Columbia University project. It's stated in the book. It is also stated in the book that the leading person in the book is a man named Richard Cohen, a Jewish man. You see, if you don't want to read that, then we can't talk about the book and the simplisms. Now, the second person is an Indian boy named Ali, born in India, but of Pakistani parentage at Columbia, who is a student of Manning. We want to keep the facts, you know. That's what Malcolm always did. Next is that this, this, this book in the last three years, Manning has been sick with massive heart attacks and massive medical problems, which meant to me that Manning didn't have did much of the work in the last three years. Which means to me then, as a Columbia project, that this is a setup and Manning dies on the day the book is published. That's not an accident of history. Those things don't fall out of the sky. That had nothing to do with Jesus. It has to do with how I think. You understand that? Just like Malcolm's death is not an accident of history. And he himself talks about it. So that the publishing of the book and the death of, of Manning, and my mother used to say, let the dead, the dead bury the dead. You understand that? So I want to stay away from Manning and his book. However, now let, let's, let's deal with, with the, the payoff on the book. And the reason why he dies is because he cannot what? Explain what he did. The mic. The mic. He cannot explain what he did. He's not here. So we can't hear from him. So we have to do what? Speculate for the next five or ten years. We have to speculate. And what a speculation brings, it brings irresponsibility in terms of our analysis and giving preference to that which was done as called serious and academic work. In addition to which, three people support the book and said that this is the definitive study on the book. Cornel West, Jesus. Skip Gates, and, 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 and Michael Dyson. These three people don't agree on anything else <laughs> except this book is the most important book. On, 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 on. That, that's not a coincidence of history. That's a payoff. Mm. Any mafia would tell you that. Speaking you get paid to do that. Don't be, we, we can't be silly up inside of here. Yes. All right. Now, yes. let's deal with the context yes. of the book. Let's deal with the context of the book. Yes. The book makes sure that it destroys everybody in the book and then leaves the author as the only source and the only person standing. Mm. That is what is called deconstruction and then reconfiguring of Malcolm. That's, That's what he said it does and it executes that. Now if Cohen had published that book because this boy couldn't finish it, you would be mad today about the book mm. and what it said. Now what does the book deal with deconstruction? It deconstructs Malcolm as a man who couldn't be trusted and as a person whose names Names, Satan, Detroit Red, and all of these were not artificial constructs to, in order to provide a certain image of him. 
and that he was party to that. The book says that, that this man it was not the same person in all his different images, and they were reconfigured in a certain kind of way that he himself was party of. Means that he wasn't honest and he wasn't for real. We're talking about a real man here today. The, the books suggest that he wasn't for real. No. Secondly, the book suggests that, that Betty, that Betty, his wife, after not interviewing his children, that Betty, his wife, was what? Unfaithful to him and that he was unfaithful to her. Now that book, that means that is very real for black people who are unfaithful to each other, historically. From yes, yes. then till now, we have been unfaithful and you unfaithful to me and I'm unfaithful to you. It has nothing to do with sex, it has to do with fidelity and morality. Yes. Not sex! Yes. It has nothing to do with sex! Once you have, you have been able to, to take that fidelity and morality and, and my word is my bond. Because Malcolm says, he said, Betty was the only person he was telling precisely what was happening to him on an everyday basis with regard to his life and death. He said that. Isn't he really said that? I have it here in a quote. And he says not only that too, that he calls upon this woman on the day that he's going to die. When he knows he's going to die, he calls her from a hotel and says, come and bring the children. Can you do that with your woman? Mm. You know you're going to die and you'll be shot mercilessly, not by the people who you claim they're being shot at, because Malcolm said it was bigger than them, it was <coughs> run by the state apparatus. Mm -hmm. Even though they may play the part in it, Malcolm said the state apparatus was responsible for my death. And we have to blame the state. And he tells her to come and be a witness to this moment in time knowing that the problems that the children will have to face for the rest of their life would not be an easy one. Because none of us will hook up with Malcolm's daughters to take care of her, take care of them in the way that Malcolm wanted them to be taken care of. Because we're too goddamn coward. Mm -hmm. Fear is in our hearts. So therefore we don't have nothing to do with Malcolm's six or five or six daughters. Right? That's the second part. He makes Ella into a, 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 a prostitute, a whore, or, or whatever it is you want to make Ella into, but not the kind of woman that Malcolm talks about. He turns Ella into a monster, a Frankenstein monster that nobody could get along with, including Malcolm. She was not a loving person. Malcolm doesn't speak of Ella in that way. And I, I met Malcolm close up in Boston. <coughs> I never spoke of Ella like that, but this, this, man, this man speaks of Ella. I knew Betty on a day-to-day -day basis going to lunch with her. Betty never said those things. But he's did, and you will tell me I must be indifferent to that. Mm -hmm. What I know I must be indifferent to. The problem with us is that we don't know. And because we don't know, we let other people who we think know right. <coughs> tell us. Because the book has 600 pages, therefore yeah. we let them decide for us what we know. I know what I know because I put in 10,000 hours every year studying and reading and thinking and reflecting with my friends. That's how I get to know. I don't get to know because I read some stupid ass book by somebody. <laughs> That's That's finally, 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 he makes the nation of Islam, whom we have disliked from day one. We've always disliked the nation of Islam. When Malcolm came to Harvard, he talked about eight or 10 of us who came to hear the lecture. And when we walked into the lecture, the eight or 10 of us, we walked in and we see all these black people sitting down there at the lecture at Harvard University. And you know what? You know what we said? What are they doing there? Because we were one in each department that was fully integrated. One in law school, one in business school, one in philosophy, one in religion, fully integrated. And therefore, we didn't want those black people in there from the nation of Islam. Because we didn't know how they would get on or whether they would ask questions with green verbs, etc. And Malcolm gave one of the most brilliant speeches in his life. And when he was finished, he said he wanted to talk to the, to, 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 to the eight of us. And we showed up. And he asked the eight of us to come and help him, like he asked Brother Peter and come and work with him, and help him. And you know what all of us said, including me? Sorry, my brother, I can't go with you. I got to go with integration. I got to go with you. We turned Malcolm down. All of us turned him down. That's the Malcolm I knew. And you know what? He laughed. And you know what my excuse was? As a Trinidadian, you know what, brother? I can't deal with your your, your organization because you know I, I grew up eating whatever I could get as a poor black boy. So pork chops was always important to me. And I I cannot be in a relationship with no organization or religion that says what that women must wear 
things over their head and long dresses. So I want to see some legs. <laughs> I want to see some arms. And you know what? I'm saying all of that. And he looked at me and he just laughed at me. And he says, brother, you know, yeah, you're telling the truth. You're from Trinidad. I know that. <laughs> but you know what? I never stopped to think the nuns wore, Jeez, brother. wore the same Jeez. kind of clothes. Amen. I never stopped to think of that. And I didn't have anything against them, but I had something against Muslim women. I had to deal with, with, with whether we would move from Victoria's Secrets in the 19th century and Victoria Prudery to what? Victoria's Secrets in the 21st century where women take off all their clothes and we want to make them happy with no clothes on. Because that's what Carnival in Trinidad is all about. Yeah. That's Malcolm. That's Malcolm. So I want you to say that don't take this book and tell me what you don't care about this and you don't care about everything said in that book. Strips Malcolm apart, strips yes. the nation apart, strips Betty apart, strips Ella apart, strips all of us apart. Mm -hmm. And say that what we thought we were fighting for is absolutely irrelevant in the age of Obama. That book is written for gentrified people. Mm -hmm. It is written for, yes. for, for, for a, new, a, new, a new white population in urban America and around the yes. world. Yes. To really find a man who supported the Bandung Conference, who supported the Congo, who supported the Nkrumah, who supported the office one after the other. And you will tell me nothing about that is written in that book or dealt with who the people Malcolm knew. They're not accidents of history. We are very real people. And stop, my brother, as much as I love you, stop being so simplistic and talk about you don't care who Malcolm sleep with. Yes, I care who my woman sleep with, and I care who I sleep with. That's right. I always will care. Because I may be sleeping with the enemy, Ooh, and I will die as a result of that. The brothers behind you. The brothers behind you. You brother. Yeah, you got it. Sure. Uh, brothers and sisters, thank you. This has been truly phenomenal to be here. I wanted to make a point and then do an introduction. I want to remind everyone, I worked for the National Park Service at the Jefferson Memorial, and even with DNA evidence, people refused to acknowledge that Thomas Jefferson was a child molester, a an abuser, he was yeah. a pedophile, he was a rapist. Right. White people defend their heroes. Mm -hmm. Malcolm is worthy of our undulterated support, and all of our leaders, anyone who stood up for us, we should never allow not so close to their death for them to be destroyed like this book aims to do. Uh, Jared Hoover, a transvestite, a pedophile, a killer, yet people deny his gayness to this day. So I'm curious, and it's not a question, why it is, whether it's Martin Luther King or Malcolm X or Patrice Lumumba, the sex lives of our great black men and women become a cannon fodder to sell books for people who hate us. Yeah. That's my point. Wow. And uh, on behalf of the executive committee of the Pan-African Congress of South Africa, yeah. Dr. Uh, Peko is here because he wanted to say how to <laughs> And I think that, like you said, Dr. Lynch, should be in the book, that he'd come all the way from Johannesburg just to be here in Sankofa with us tonight. I'd like to thank this August body for uh, sharing with us the ideas. And uh, I'm Brother Oduno. I am a Garveyite since 1968. The Evergreen Division, number 50, in Seattle, Washington. And just to give you some context, I don't have to talk about my history here in Washington, D.C. What does Malcolm mean to me? As what was expressed in terms of Malcolm being a master teacher, I just want to, sh I, I ju I just want to share that Malcolm listened to the genius of our people. And... There's, there are women, Sister Ella has already been named, there's Jewel Rosebud Crawford Mazik, 1937 graduate of the history department with a master's degree and 1957 graduate. And there's, and there's Pauline Myers who was the national secretary for Issa Philip Randolph. 
One thing about being a master teacher, you got to first be a master student. Mm. And Malcolm was a master student, whether he was in elementary school, whether he was in the Nation of Islam, whether he was Detroit Red, he was a master student. And we, I take from him that in order to be put in authority as a master teacher, you got to first go through the protocol of the flame of being a master student. And there are too many of us. We want to have a microwave arrival. Mm. <laughs> Rather than going through the fire in the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Community, Community League, that what you do today for your people, it makes impact to the generation, not only today, but the yet unborn. Mm. But remember that a master teacher has to be a master student. Brother Under. Dino, Brother Dino, Dino, thank you. Let me sit down. Thank you, Brother. Um, look, I'm going to ask you all to bear with me. Um, try to keep your questions short. I leaned up on Ackland. Ackland's my elder, and, and I, I have never seen Ackland's button push like that. Okay? <laughs> His button got pushed. I was wondering whether it was something generational. <laughs> no, really, it was beautiful. But, but Paul, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Holly, Holly is but I calling think, my attention. Paul, so Paul I think we're dissipating something. Okay. Because in Auckland, I mean, so we, you know, his, he Can't poured his, okay, Holly, okay. Holly. No, I'm saying he poured his heart on one issue, very important yeah. issue. Yeah. That I think is very important Holly, in terms of, no, no, I can be heard. It's, <laughs> no, you can be heard. Because I'd like you to speak back. Because I hear, I hear what you're saying, I hear what Ackland is saying, I don't think that's what this brother is saying, and I don't think that's what Tanahasi is saying. I really don't. E even though I have different positions, and so what I'm, what I'm hearing is a dynamic okay, let's for, hear for us to examine ourselves. Let's hear this folks, man, I would, I would like with Garvey's thing. Go ahead. Um, my name is Brother Kaba. Um, I read the book. Um, I had seen Man Manning Marable on democracy now a couple of times over the years and I was very excited by what I had seen in the interviews. I was looking forward to this book at the time. I have been in media myself for about 16 years. One thing I know about media, and this goes to that point about whether or not it matters, you can tell what the what this stress is going to be on a project by how it is sold. They always want, we, we, in, our, in the business I'm in, we want to market to you. We have to find things that, that are going to sell. And in this society, which is a pretty decadent society, more salacious things are going to be what is going to be put out there to sell. And lots have been, I've read pretty much all the reviews, I've heard many of the shows, especially with Dr. Ball and others across the country, talking about this issue and they bring up the fact that a lot of the information about the assassination about this man William Bradley who's still alive in, in, uh, in Newark uh, was, was the man who you know, fired this fatal shot, the shotgun. Uh, Dr. Zach Kondo wrote that in 1993 in his book, I saw it back there, Conspiracies. Um, and also some of the other information that, Doc, that uh, Carl Evans, Evans put in his books on Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm. Uh, so a lot of this information isn't new. but in terms of the assassination, etc. But we have to consider this also, the salacious stuff isn't new either. About eight years ago, somebody gave me, uh, somebody, I was at, matter of fact, Bob, I was at a presentation that you did at the, uh, at the Martin Luther King Library, I don't know, maybe about seven, eight years ago. And after the presentation, I met this, this, this gentleman, he put me onto this book. He said, there's a gentleman by the name of Bruce Perry who wrote this book on Malcolm X. And so I read the book by Bruce Perry about Malcolm X. Bruce, and this book by Bruce Perry was written in 1991. Bruce Perry said that Malcolm X was pretty much a chameleon. That Malcolm X invented different personalities for different audiences and different times of his life. Bruce Perry also said that Malcolm X had engaged in homosexual activities. 
Bruce Perry also said that the sister Ella was such a domineering figure that she pretty much tainted Malcolm's views on women for the rest of his life. When I read this book, Manny Marable's book, not only did I see some of the things that I had read by Zach Condo about the assassination and some of the other things that Carl Evans had put into the book, his books, I also saw the things that Bruce Perry had written about Malcolm, about all those things I just mentioned. Bruce Perry was a, is a white man, Southern historian, down in, in the Southern university systems. He was very um, condescending to Malcolm. Very, and he also says, alleges in his book, that Malcolm made up the story about his father being killed by white people. He says that it was an accident. He also said that, Bruce Perry also said that Malcolm uh, Malcolm's father set the house on fire. Oh. Not only that, Bruce Perry also said that Malcolm set his own house on fire. So when we understand the context of all of these things, we have to really understand that yes, it does matter. Because it's, it's, not, a, it's not even a question about, because sometimes I think our, 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 our understanding about sexuality or our feelings about sexuality come into play and we say, well, if, if, if we don't have a, if we, if we are supportive of homosexuality, most people will say it doesn't matter. But we're talking about facts. We, we, we cannot allow our personal opinions about a lifestyle to get in, to get, come into play, because ultimately it's not really about the homosexuality, it's about whether or not it's true. I'm a vegetarian. If somebody did a, a, a biography on Brother Kaba and said that he ate at McDonald's every Friday, that may not necessarily be, uh, pertinent to my story necessarily, but it's factually inaccurate. So someone who knows Brother Kaba would say, no, Brother Kaba was a vegan. Brother Kaba <laughs> became a vegan in 1995. That's inaccurate. So, th so that, that's pretty much my take, and, and, I'm gonna, and I do have a question for you, Bob, and I'm going to wrap it up. But this coming Saturday, we have a, I belong to United Black Community. We have a program where we talk about Malcolm X. We, every, we honor Malcolm X every year. It's called Kuzaliwa. I have a few flyers. It's on Bunker Hill Road in Northeast. It's from 1 to uh, 8 p.m. And this year, every year we have uh, a theme where we talk about different things. This year we're going to be talking about eldership in the community and about um, uh, an eldership council. We have uh, some honorees this year. Uh, Dr. Uh, Alice Galati will be the keynote speaker, and she's also an honoree. Uh, Mama Nia Kumba, who a lot of people know, she's going to be an honoree. Baba Kalanji Osugun. Mama Asante Holly, and last but not least, Dr. Atkin Lynch will be yes. celebrated as well. So please come on out to that. That's on Saturday. But my question to my question is, uh, Rodnell Collins also wrote a book on Malcolm Seven Child. He was Ella's son. Ella's son. Was he was he the biological son of Ella? And and he also co-wrote it with you. And he also made some of these accusations about homosexuality. Just wanted to know what you thought about that and your your position on that. <clears throat> First of all, I don't I don't know about Rodnell making uh, making those accusations. I like I said, if that's in the book, I'm not sure because I have not read the book yet. But I will say that that uh, when I worked with Rodnell on that book, uh, Seventh Child: A Family Memoir of Malcolm X, uh, I have I had the opportunity to read numerous letters that uh, between Brother Malcolm and Sister Ella, letters that well, we we were going to publish in the book, but the publisher would not allow us to do so. The mm. publisher's lawyers say that we couldn't do it mm. because I found out that when, if you write someone a letter, mm. the letter belongs to the person who wrote it, mm. not to the person who got it. And since the relationship between uh, Sister Betty and Sister Ella was not exactly the best relationship in the world, uh, the, the publisher was afraid to, to publish those letters uh, that, that we had uh, between Sister Ella and uh, Brother Malcolm. But in that I found those letters fascinating because it, I actually saw Brother Malcolm in those letters like a younger brother talking to his big sister. She, she, he regarded her as one of his major confidants. So this whole idea that she was some kind of reckless person, and you would never know if you read those, I read those letters. And when she was, she, he, he looked to her for advice. And she would also be, jump on it. Right. She wanted him to, 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 to pack his bags and take his family and take one of those jobs that he was offered in Africa. Mm -hmm. That was her position. You have yeah. done enough. Got that right. 
You have helped. You've contributed. Now yet take your family and mm -hmm. and leave. And he wouldn't do so. That's exactly. He wanted her to. She wanted him. She said, "You need to shut up. Don't say nothing about those women, you know, who had, you know, children uh, uh, by Elijah Muhammad. Those were grown women. They were not babies. You know, they made a decision. So you stay out of it." But I found out that why he couldn't stay out of it to some degree was that one of the women was a young woman who had been in love with him, who had followed him from Boston to New York. And in order to kind of get her out of his hair, because he would devote his whole time to what he was doing in terms of the movement, he kind of recommended her for a job out in Chicago. And she ended up being one of the women who got pregnant. That was a very human thing. He felt a little bit bad about that. I got that from re, you know from working on that book. I got a lot of family stuff that had you know that had never been published before from working. I went to a little family reunion. I went to a little family reunion down in Orlando, Florida, with 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 with, with, with littles who still live in rural Georgia and who do not want to be known as relatives of Malcolm X to this day because they're afraid that it will cause them problems. I mean, we can say they're, they're in rural Georgia still. They went to the churches where, where Earl Sr. used to be uh, an itinerant pastor when we were working. We went down there to, to that part of Georgia. So uh, I try my best, you know, to, to be cool sometimes. When I hit, when I, like after, and I get upset when I hear people talking about the harshness. You know when I shut them up? One day, I sat down and took down all the names of all the people who had been lynched between 1955 and 1965, mm -hmm. and I read them off. I said that was rampant terrorism mm -hmm. going on in this country at that time, and that's what he was responding to. And when I said that, nobody else raised the question about the harshness of his speeches, mm -hmm. because they never thought about that. Mm -hmm. He was responding to rampant terrorism that happened between 1955 and 1965. And, and, and so whenever I go speak now, I start off by reading the names of all those people who were, who were killed uh, between 1955 and 1965. You know, one thing we learned, we learned from Brother Malcolm, as a te again, as a master teacher, he told us to do your homework. Because you know when you go out to speak from our position, there are people in the audience whose sole purpose for being there is to catch you with your facts wrong. So he told us to make sure that we, whatever we do, try to make sure they might disagree with our interpretation, with our opinion, but they would never catch us with our facts wrong. Mm. Okay. Could, I say just, could I just say one little thing quickly? Whenever we use a date, 1993, this is the publication of Perry's book, 1991. We must ask ourselves, what is happening in the world when that book is published? And if we look around at what is happening in the world in 1991 and 1993, we will see two worlds. The collapse of the Soviet Union and the emergence of China. When we look at 2010 and 2011, we must ask ourselves, what is happening in the world then? So we could put whatever it is we're reading in a larger context of understanding so that we're not talking about Perry in abstraction. We're not talking about a book that is just written by a certain kind of man. And we got to do the research on Perry. And then we've got to ask ourselves, why did Cohen rely on Perry's book? That's what we've got to ask ourselves. What is the connection between Cohen's work and Perry's work? Because Cohen is still alive. You understand that? So we have to do a, a, a larger kind of thing. We've got to ask ourselves one last thing. When Malcolm speaks in 1964 in Cairo, good, on the NASA, we've got to ask ourselves, who were the members and the heads of state that attended that conference? What decisions did they make? And what were the implications of their lives between 1964 and 1974? From 
from Kennedy to Johnson to, 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 to Nixon to Carter as we move into the Carter and the age. We must ask those questions because you can't take out that and you'll find out who got killed, who got overthrown, who, what happened to each and every person that supported Malcolm in that point in time. Yes. You must do that body of work. Yeah. If you don't do that body of work, you, 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 don't have, you can't talk. That's what John Henry Clark used to teach us. Yeah. If you don't do the work, you can't talk. <laughs> Keep quiet and, and find out from somebody else. That was Sterling Brown used to teach us. That's what CLR James used to teach us. You've got to do the work in order to be able to be able to come and, 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 and talk to us. Thank you, John. Um, Nikita, you want to speak on that? Uh, but, but I'll take questions from the floor, Nikita. Well, this just goes from before, because everybody talks about all, the, all these acts of homosexuality. Um, I read uh, the book. I read the autobiography of Malcolm X, um, first and foremost. And in the story that he told to Alex Haley, before he went to prison, he was a steerer. He steered people to people who would provide sex. He himself provided the story of the white man who paid someone, he said it was Shorty or whatever it was, to rub him down with talcum powder and, and, and massage him or whatever. Whether it was him, whether it was Shorty, to tell you the truth, it really wouldn't surprise me one way or the other because that's the type of life, Malcolm, that was the life of a hustler. If someone, some white man is going to pay you to rub some talcum powder on point, I mean, I'm just saying. So that's the only, but wait a minute, that's the only act. I'm not saying it doesn't matter. I'm, but, no, listen, listen, listen. What I'm saying is that is the only reference to anything closely resembling homosexuality in Manny Melville's book. The only, the, it is the only reference. Something that happened before he even went into prison, which he related an instance himself to Alex Haley. I mean, I'm, I'm just, so all of this room and say, hey, all these acts of homosexuality, I mean, I don't know what was in Bruce Perry's book. I ain't never even heard of Bruce Perry. But that is the only, and even at that, with Manny Marable saying it was him as opposed to Shorty, again, no substantiate, no, no, no nothing, no this, no that. He leaves you hanging with some instance with some white woman in some other country. Well, yeah, whatever it is, no substantiate. <laughs> Should I care? He tells us that Malcolm could not satisfy his wife sexually. Yes, so he was I could care less. I'm going to say it right there. I could care less what what he did in the bed. I mean, I'm just saying. To me, that it, it, it's totally. Yeah. 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 Let's deal with that. It's totally. You know, but, but, but I, I just want to oh, just please. conclude, you know, by saying <laughs> a lot of that stuff was none of my business. As far as I'm concerned, it's none of Manny Marable's business. It really is in the world's business. And I know I still don't understand the purpose, okay, for all of that even being in there. It was just distracting. Right. Okay. okay. We're, we're, we're going to have this um, last one from the panel, and then we'll move back to the floor. Oh. Uh, one, of the things, um, one of the things I've learned, having come up in this community, is a, a respect for elders. So it's actually a little difficult to uh, say this, um, but I think I feel like a coward if I don't. Um, I'm not sure what this brother was saying, but my understanding wasn't so much that the errors or the fact of errors don't matter, but that he just took something else up, took something from Malcolm. He holds him to heart no matter what. Yeah, well, I just think he took yeah. what he saw in Malcolm was something different. They can't really be affected by you know what his relationship was. You know, uh, frankly, with his wife, I even got to say that. You know what I mean? With his wife, what happened before he went to jail. That was the impression that I got from what he was saying. And I just want to say, I think if we expect, you know, Malcolm to live on and to bloom and to go on to uh, other generations, you have to be open, we have to be open to the idea of folks seeing different things and seeing them in different ways. And I'm just worried when we shout cats down like that, you know, they walk away and say, well, maybe he isn't for me. Maybe maybe they're right. Maybe he ain't for me, and I would I would hate for that to happen. So. Okay. Bob. Yeah. Uh, you know I want to thank everybody for an excellent presentation. Today is a day we should celebrate. Yeah. 86 years of yeah. Dr. the Shining Prince. Yeah. And in closing, I would not be standing here right now 
as conscious as I think I see myself and working for the movement if I was not inspired by a way the way Malcolm came out of the street. I was in the street. So to all the young people under 50, take very serious note of what the elders are saying here now. Because now that I'm 60, I could have been anywhere in this world. But because I was motivated by Malcolm X coming out of the street into the movement, and moving even beyond that and becoming a shining prince for black people all over the world who don't even speak English. We have to understand that there's an evil force that always is gonna to wanna to take away that motivation that still is a motivating light. I was at the March on Washington in 1963 at 11 years of age. I was motivated by Dr. King, but I would have never known Marcus Garvey if it was not for Malcolm X and for his mother and father and to be in the movement today. So young people take heed to that because the ancestors are still living in a, in a, in a bigger way than we can imagine. Do not slander them like you won't slander your mother. Always hold them to the highest of high and never forget that man and woman is a disagreeable beast. Any one of us could fall low at any time, but when you give your life for humanity like Malcolm did, you can't deal with what was happening when he was in the gutter. He came out of the gutter and became a shining prince. So really hear what the elders are saying here. Because if we let somebody else make us think less of the higher part of Malcolm, what do we think of ourselves? Can you speak up like that? No, no. I'll, I'll, I'll try to speak up. All right. The Bible says, beware of sins of the flesh, right? We're talking about that cardinal nature. It also says, in all thy getting, get understanding, right? Now, just to, 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 to make an example, I'm going to tell you a, a lesson that my father taught me. My father had a, had a book of quote-unquote knowledge, right? He had a book of his chess secrets, his strategies, right? He didn't hide it, but what he did was, when you open it up, there was a picture of a naked woman in there, right? He said, I don't ever have to hide the book because anybody tried to steal my chess secrets is going to get caught up on this picture of a naked woman, right? And he was teaching me about the cardinal nature and denying the cardinal nature for a higher purpose, right? Your higher nature, right? So when they put Malcolm X is uh, a homosexual, this little poison in, in what is Malcolm X, right? We all have to realize that we have to turn away from our own carnal nature because it's just poison to turn us away from our higher nature of understanding what Malcolm X really is. Now, tonight we have a, a, a prestigious panel, people that work with Malcolm. We have master teachers, right? But look how much time we spent talking about the carnal nature, right? We're not getting the higher meaning. We're not getting to intellect of all that Malcolm is and how he could inspire us and the knowledge that we can take from that and internalize it in ourselves. So I came here to talk about, the the, 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 uh, the flyer said, come here to talk about what Malcolm meant to you. And I came here to, to give a little bit and to learn a lot, right? But we spent a lot of time talking yeah. about sex. So all I'm saying is one, <laughs> identify it, and two, fast. Be strong enough to turn away from your cardinal nature so you can get the true meaning. Holly's from the floor. Let me tell you, I was not even clear earlier. Let me just say this. The most dangerous thing, okay, the most dangerous thing is to make this thing a discussion of homosexuality. I think it's like you're going to be categorized as a form of homophobic etc. And the, the things that we're interested at Sankofa, as far as I'm concerned, is a, an issue of integrity. Yes, sir. And this thing that comes out of your mouth to a person. And I think the modality of Malcolm X internationally, I'm from Ethiopia, the way I know him is really through his integrity. Mm -hmm. Integrity. He could have been a politician, he could have said appeasing things for his personal life. He's a guy who died poor, but rich because he won the world for his principles and integrity. Now, you can, you know, within the principle integrity, evolving and growing is not reinventing. I think what this book, the title alone, what it does subliminally is that Malcolm, Malcolm X was 
an eternal shyster. He invented, you know, he invented. The black struggle could invent people like him. And the most important part is that he sets a modality of principle and integrity. To me, that's what's at stake, not the sexual thing. We talk about, for example, adultery, okay? Within the partnership you enter. That is a very important issue now, as far as I'm concerned. I don't want to let go of that point because of how, how seriously our young people have not taken the, the, the value of words when we say, I love you. When we say, I will do, I'll marry you. It's connected. Struggle is nothing without this basic vocabularies of human relationship. You can never construct an abstract black thing. Why is it that a lot of the black leaders, including rappers, would do anything, say anything? They say Malcolm's name, Martin's name, and then they accuse for raping an eight-year-old girl, etc., etc. I'm saying there's an integrity issue that our young people need to get from the past generation. In the sexual obsession culture of white America, when it permeates in black people, black people themselves have become it. Then what alternative are they going to supply for the life of Malcolm X, for what he lived? What, what is the payment then to the world that respects him? And I'm saying, no, don't let go of something. I'm, you know, I know this brother. I respect this brother. This brother is here. I respect them. You are. I respect you. You came here. I know how it's students who are not here who should be here. At my age, I'm still shooting a camera, setting a table. I've taught over how many students to be filmmakers? Where are they? Because they're carrying Jesse on a chair as a goddamn next king somewhere and not working on the ideas of things that they espouse in their mouth about black people. For black people, I'm for my people. It's all t-shirt bragging. And I'm saying, no, no, no. Malcolm X should be discussed to challenge you guys, not the ones who came here. I'm really, this is what it gets divisive. It's not you, it's not this brother here. There's a generation at my school, at Howard, where I teach. A word means nothing. Promise means nothing. Grade is to be given. If you don't give it, you're, not, you're a bad teacher. If you love them and require them to work hard, they hate you. And the university evaluates you based on that and the kind of grade I refuse to give to you. A morality breakdown, a breakdown of principle and integrity. At a time like this, when white folks produce Malcolm, we should produce the counter issue of what he means to us. To me, he means to me, this foreigner, integrity and principle. You know, I'm married to a woman who we're building this place. I've seen many attractive women I could really, you know. But what holds you is the promise of the respect you have to have for that woman you are living with. The children who coming behind you are going, how am I going to face my kids if I'm not living up to my principle and my integrity? What is happening to my students now? I, I'm telling you, I am very, I'm about to leave Howard. Because not the say I've never been paid what I deserve. I'm a, I can go anywhere in the world and be paid bigger than goddamn this place. But <laughs> Howard kids have been my special love. From the day I came to Howard, I left the whole white Hollywood world to come to Howard to meet black kids from all over the world. For the past five, ten years, I'm disappointed at the lack of integrity. If a teacher is stupid, so long as he gives a good grade, it's okay. Yeah. If a student requires to say, listen, you're like my son. If you don't do homework, I want to fail you. I want to flunk you to shock the hell out of you to make you work next semester. I did this. I went to Germany, flunked about four of them. Even the dean was calling me all the way from Germany. I said, I don't dispense bread like UNESCO milk, OK? I don't give out milk. I give people who deserve grade. I flunk them because I love them. And I think this is what Malcolm means to me. Malcolm X means integrity and principle. And I'm, I'm still imperfect, like trying to grow however old I am. All of us are this imperfect people. But what he means to us, what I would want my children, who are not even here, except maybe one, is two maybe, and I have six, okay? I can't beg you. Yesterday, Malcolm X's son was here. They were not here. I was angry. 
I wanted them to hear him. Okay, my own kids. I'm angry at my own kids for not being here. But I don't want to force them like a fascist also. So I am in this situation. But I want when they date, who they date, who they go. I don't care where they go. But they better respect that sister. My sons better respect and have integrity for the shit they promised that woman. The same to my sister, my daughters. I will kill a black man who messes up with my daughters. That's why I say, I don't want to meet your boyfriend because I might end up killing him if he hurts you. Because I don't like black men the way they're treating black women now. I don't like it. I have three daughters. I'm scared like hell in the way they're treating the, the young women at Howard. Black men with good t-shirt, Malcolm X t-shirt, Martin and Malcolm t-shirt, fashion, fashion, nothing, nothing, no principle, no integrity. I'm saying to you, I, I told them I don't want to be here today because what he means to me is integrity and principle. And this generation better be challenged. It's not Aklin. Aklin and me, we're going to go out of here. But it's you guys better require from your friends what they say to whoever they say, they better no, there's a consequence to that word. In some societies, you get shot for the wrong word. That's right. I learned from everything you just said. I just want to kind of make clear my point. No, no, I'm clear, my brother. I'm glad you're here. It's nice. I'm talking about the ones who are not here. I'm saying Malcolm X was assassinated because they, didn't, they were feared all that he is and could become, right? What's kind of interesting is that the wise brother right here didn't even want to discuss the book, right? Because once the book comes up, we're, it's going, we're going to be diverted from everything that Malcolm X really is. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned that denying that cardinal nature so that we can stay on the path of knowledge, right? So Okay, we are together. Well, I, mean, I don't disagree this, with this, you. I'm just saying say it's not really about you. My frustration is the yeah. culture of young people, my brother, well, all I'm saying is that which you we, know. We, we have to be aware of the concept of that cardinal nature. Well, what it does to us. My brother, I so, mean, that's the gift yeah, you gave right, us this right, evening. Right. To some of us, it's like I mean, some test we passed some, some years ago. Let me just say something very quickly. Cardinal. One of the central issues that we faced here, we face here in this society and in this world, is our inability to deal with foreign policy questions. So that the memory of the Haitian Revolution has disappeared from our consciousness. Whether it is Dessalines, or whether it is Toussaint, or, or whoever it is, it has disappeared from our consciousness. But more importantly, it has disappeared from our consciousness as it relates to its impact on Gabriel Prosser, Denmark Vesey, and Nat others, Turner. and Nat Turner, and David Walker. It disappeared. Now, David Walker and, Gre and, and, and these other people have also disappeared from our consciousness in the 20th century. And, and we, can, we can look at that carefully. They are not part of our consciousness. We are, do have no intentions of writing as journalists like David Walker. We have no intentions of being Nat Turner. We have no intentions of being Gabriel Prosser and organizing South Carolina in that way. However, we get into the, 21st century, in the 20th century and as we become Garveyites, as we become Du Bois people, as we become Malcolms and Martins, that organization, that body of work is now disappearing from us. Yeah. It is now disappearing from us in the 21st century. We are in the age of Obama. We are in another world. And therefore, we must come to grips with the world that we're living in. And, and come into grips with the world that we're living in, the result of it, in the, in the, in the first 10 years of the, of, 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 the, of the 21st century, is the book of Malcolm X. The book of Malcolm X is a very strategic book that compels us not to think of Malcolm or study Malcolm from ourselves, but to, to do it from the point of view of people who are considered legitimate in academia. Mm -hmm. That's why it is not Man in Marable alone. It is Cornel West, it is Skip Gates, and it is Mike, Mike, Michael Tyson. And all around the country, we will... <laughs> Mike Michael Tyson. Tyson. <laughs> but all around the country, we are going to be gathering, and all the radio stations doing what? Discussing this book that's going to sell a million copies. 
and engaging ourselves rather than simply sitting down in our homes with our children and our women and our men and our friends and discussing seriously what we should read and how we should look at Malcolm without having to move in that direction. We are, now, finally, finally, this man talks about people who belong to um, uh, FBI and CIA people. And he suggests that in, 90, from, in 1958 to 1964, 65 when Malcolm was, 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 that there were people who had penetrated the Nation of Islam and the organizations that Malcolm said. Who are those people? Are those people like us in this room? Or are they like Perry? Who are those people? We have no, we don't know who they are. But if those people were successful in penetrating us, that is defense intelligence, whether it is the Mossad, the ESI, the CSI, wherever it is, if defense intelligence is important, and it has helped the national state structure to have a certain impact against us, whether it is the Black Panther Party or, 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 or whoever it is. In, in a, if it is, then how does this book, or how do we elevate ourselves to understand the significance of penetration into Sankofa books and our ideas and our discussions and our discussions of trust and our elevation of analysis so that we could be better prepared for the 21st century on the basis of the fact that people like us could betray us by working for the master's to for the master's house. You understand that? And that's what Malcolm was trying to bring us to understand. That foreign policy issues, global issues, Malcolm was talking about global issues, that issues of democracy and the bankruptcy of democracy is right in front of us. And that's what we must be discussing. That's what we must be looking at. If we don't look at that, we would not. We will all be. I have a sister I went to give a talk at, um, at Howard University. And this sister comes to me right after I gave this talk uh, for, for, for Gareth, for what the, the brother of yours on, on PFW, Jared and all of them. And this sister comes Jared to me and she Ball. said, Jared Ball and all, all, all of them, they had a thing and they asked me to come and talk at Howard. And I went to talk, you know, and you know what the sister came up here from there and she says, you know, she says, I am 40 something years old and I am thinking of going to work after I finish talking for the CIA and, and for defense intelligence. <laughs> how do I, and then she asked me, how do I help black, help, people. Help black people and move forward and get into the CIA and the FBI? You understand that? In other words, I'm saying to you that there are more and more of us who not just going to Wall Street, who not just going to corporate America, who not just going to the to politics, but who are going into agencies that are preparing for us, those who may decide to lead or those who may decide to speak out, speak truth to power, as Damu said, they are preparing a menace, a Frankenstein monster for the future. And Malcolm warned us about that Frankenstein monster. We better take it seriously. Right. Yeah. We, we, we are right at, at close. Yeah, yeah we, we are right at close. Um, Go ahead, shoot a few if, people. If, if I can just grab some I things from the floor back and I'll keep there. the panel down. There's a sister back there who had her hands okay. up early. All right. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, sister, please. You first and then the sister here, okay. please. Uh, let me say thank you as well. And let me say, I am. I've been out here, been in the movement, I'm wearing the movement. Let me say, I am happy that Mr. Manning wrote this book. Because it has helped me to know Malcolm. Let me got say something got it, got it. about this discussion or this yeah. controversy about Malcolm being homosexual. I hope if that's the case, Malcolm was happy. Got because, <laughs> because in the District of Columbia, this thing called Down and Low, down low is a crisis. The the uh, the uh, age, HIV and AIDS rate in this city is higher than any city in the in the world, and it's partly because of down low. So I want this controversy to make people appreciate sexuality on a continuum 
in their homosexuality. A lot of these folks who I'm convinced are upset about homosexuality are upset because they think in a few years when they're out of here and somebody writes their biography, they're going to tell the truth about them as well. So I want to hope that we can take this controversy and make it seem or make it appreciable for people to be involved in wherever they have found themselves on the continuum of sexuality. All right. Thank you, sister. Ooh. Go ahead. Uh, greetings, everyone. My name is Ajwa, and I'm very happy to be here to um, speak about what Malcolm X means to me. I actually first heard of Malcolm in seventh grade. I was like 12 or 11, and I read his autobiography when I was in eighth grade, so you can tell I didn't grow up in this. I kind of taught myself all of this um, in learning about him. And Malcolm, his manhood, he's an example of manhood for me. And I think from what I heard in this conversation, we were kind of minimizing a lot of things that I think we as African youth, we in this current generation are missing. When we minimize sex, I think it aids to this, it helps kind of just make sex nothing. And we, we, we forget the sacredness. If we have a short comment from the panel, it's cool too. Maybe we should do that. Maybe we'll just close out yeah, a short comment give them from the, the panel. Yeah. Can, can we do that? Yeah. Short comment. And and hopefully no one busts a blood vessel up here. I thought we were going to have to go into CPR <laughs> on, on my good friend Ann. You, 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 and then you, you, that you, went off that. on me. I was and then about Kylie you. went off. I was worried about you. Peter was cool. <laughs> Tana Hassey was cool. Where is this cool. guy running? <laughs> you going to make a comment? Okay, okay, good. Okay, okay we're start, start with start your son, since he started first. Okay, we're, we're going to start with Ta-Nehisi first. Um, wow, it's been intense. Um, well, first of all, thanks for having me. I was very glad to be here. Um, if I had to sum up, once again, uh, what Malcolm meant to me, it's, uh, it's funny because after this book, the word reinvention has got a, uh, a terrible name. Uh, so I think we'll stick with a word that we were using earlier, and that was transformation, self-transformation. And uh, the thing that I'm always reminded about Malcolm X, the thing I take home with me personally in my heart when you know I'm not talking about talking to anybody or anything like that, is this right to transform yourself through your own efforts. Uh, when I was young, and we would see all these films about the civil rights movement and people getting beat over the head. And, this that spray with uh, water hoses. There was always this problem of, well, if white people don't allow you to do it, you can't have it. If you can't convince them to love you, you can't have it. And so it was this notion that your own liberation, your own right to transform yourself was dependent on somebody else. And I can't tell you that I was specifically aware of that, but it was definitely lurking in the subconscious. And the attractive thing about Malcolm to me was through your own private actions, through your own reading, through your own study, through how you walk down the street, through how you talk to your mother, through how you talk to your father, you can transform yourself. You can liberate yourself. You don't have to lean on nobody. You don't have to ask other people to love you. Love yourself first. And I know that sounds cliche, but you know, sometimes cliche things are true. So. that um, don't let um, Marigold's book be your only thing you read about Malcolm. That's all I say. I mean, there's a wealth of information and uh, material out there. Someone mentioned Brother Zach Condo's book dealing with unraveling the conspiracies. and the, I mean, there's even Spike Lee's movie. And I mean, I know people say, you know, there are issues here, there, with the autobiography, etc. But, you know, explore it from a number of different um, uh, aspects as well. And the final story has not been written because we have not seen all those documents in terms of the extent of the COINTELPRO, the FBI's illegal war against the black uh, community and other communities uh, uh, as well. Uh, so that book is still yet to be, um, uh, to be written. But then the final thing I, I would like to say is I really would like to see some analysis 
um, at some point with respect to um, the movements that sprang from um, Malcolm. And I know many of us here are part of some of those um, movements. And that's all I'll say. That's great. And thank you so much um, for the high and for John for bringing us all together. I want to say thank you very much for being here. And thank you for this opportunity to engage each and every one of us in a dialogue that I'm sure will continue over time. Malcolm will not be the first that people will write or think about, but he should always remain the first in our consciousness as someone whose presence elevated us to another level of consciousness. I'm sure they're going to do the same thing on George Jackson, on Huey P. Newton, on Angela Davis, on Asata Shakur, and the list goes on and on and on. I'm sure we will see the same thing about Steve Biko, and Kwame Nkrumah, and uh, Tom Mboya, and the list goes on and on and on and on. What do we have to do then is prepare ourselves, and prepare our children and grandchildren that they will know something about the Malcolms that have influenced our time, our historical moment, and our ability to be able to say that we are extensions, that we are extensions of the Malcolms of the universe. And in so saying, that we will be able to sing, no more auction blocks for me. Again, uh, like everyone else, I want to thank everybody for being here. And I also want to say that uh, the most important thing that I think that, that, that I can say about Brother Malcolm again is that you can learn from him. There's plenty of material out there that he left that you can read and learn from, and you need to do so. Uh, you need to, to pursue as much knowledge as you can. I hate to quote a slave owning, an enslaver of African people, but James, on the front of the, uh, uh, the uh, James Madison building of the Library of Congress is a statement that goes, knowledge will forever govern ignorance. Mm. And a people who mean to govern themselves must arm themselves with the power that knowledge gives. I don't think there's anyone that I've come across in my lifetime who understood what, that, what Madison was saying that Brother Malcolm did. He understood the importance of knowledge, the importance of going into situations, knowing what's going on, having done your homework. Just good intentions are not enough. One of the things that led to so many problems, I think, for us, uh, too many people was that they thought that if, that if they had good intentions and they went the right way, that that was all they had to have. Good intentions are not enough. You've got to have knowledge. You've got to seek and pursue knowledge. And then once you get that knowledge, you have to be able to communicate it and spread it to others. That's what Brother Malcolm did. He was a, he was a reservoir of knowledge. But he also, as uh, Brother O'Donnell said, he was a student. He used to go in Michelle's bookstore and actually stay there all night. Mr. Michelle would just close the store and lock it up and leave him in there in those books. He would stay in that store all night long, reading books and learning more. It got to the point where people would write him, Malcolm X, Harlem Bookstore, and he would get the mail. <laughs> he would get the mail because people knew exactly what he was talking about. I mean, that's why he was able to do what he did, my brothers and sisters. That's why he was able to accomplish all the things that he accomplished. Because he understood the importance of knowledge. And of gathering knowledge, of absorbing knowledge, and of then distributing that knowledge to other people. He understood the importance of that. Uh, one last thing, again, a quote from, uh, and probably somebody that a lot of people have bad vibes about Nelson Mandela. But I thought the quote was good. He said, a good head 
and a good heart are a formidable combination. Brother Malcolm had a good head and a good heart. Thank you. Once again, once again, we want to thank Holly. Well, we want to thank we want to thank Anna. We want to thank everyone here for coming out. Look, let's do this. This is okay. I'm sorry. I, I had something I wanted to say. I have a Malcolm X collection that has been sitting in my apartment for about 45 years. I cannot take care of it properly. And I live in a one bedroom apartment in a seniors building. So if you know of any organization. Black Classics. That might be interested in getting that, uh, uh, buying that collection. Please Black, let Black me know. Black Classics will buy it. Okay, please yeah. let me know. And have them contact me. Uh, I can give you a cell phone number, 202-716-4560. So but I really want to, to, to put it in the hands of somebody who's going to take care of it and who's going to make sure that it is available uh, to the black community. What's in the collection? Documents, speeches, newsletters, magazine articles, uh, photographs, you know, that I have accumulated uh, over the years, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, in, in my involvement uh, with Brother Malcolm. <laughs> thank you. I want to thank you. Oh. Okay. Again, one thing. Uh, first of all, let me let me do this. Uh, Brother Peter Bailey brought some books with him. These books are on sale. Um, as you get ready to leave, please stop. Check it out. But also, there's a whole heap of books, as my brother Pepper Kai would say from England. There's a whole heap of books here on Malcolm. We just had a, a discussion going on about the Manny Marable book. Do not be mistaken. You need to buy the book. The book is on sale here. You need to buy the book. You need not take the discussion of the folks who are up here for your source on the book. You need to go through the book. You need to deal with it because it is a major work on Malcolm. It is a major work on the man who you came here to talk about and express tonight. The book is on sale. I don't know, what is it, $24.95, something like that. It's on sale. Don't miss the opportunity to read it. But when you're reading it, read it critically. That's how you learn. That's where knowledge comes from. When Peter tells us Malcolm was in, in the bookstore reading books, he wasn't just reading lines. He was critically reading, trying to critically understand. Sankofa exists as an institution in our community. We have to support it. If you've got money in your pocket, if you want some knowledge tonight, leave your money here, take the knowledge with you. Thank you, Holly. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, just, Excuse me. One second. First, we want to thank Paul and uh, Acklin for organizing it and all the rest of the panel. But on behalf of... Uh, Sankova here, let me just tell you, and my wife's or my partner, whatever language, mine is so possessive, I'll say, the, the woman I'm married to, her next film, there's a diplomat, an African diplomat, uh, speaking about Malcolm. Not only Malcolm, he, this is about Nkrumah. The film is really about African Americans going to Ghana. And he, this guy talks about how all the people who met to bring into reality the African-American cause into the OAU and then logically into the UN, the way the Palestinian cause was taken, they were all killed one by one. Okay? Now, there's one way of looking at this. Sometimes when we squabble, what we forget is the higher order who wrote the script for the killing of everybody that had been in that meeting they just got free from being responsible and accountable to what they have done to our people. Right. That's the tragedy of this whole dispute for me, is how this discussion, not the one we are having here, the kind of uh, discussion they're doing to possess Malcolm, because you know, there's a thing called the battle of ideas. Sometimes it's invisible, sometimes you march physically, but ideas are stolen while you are also asleep. There's a battle always going on. It's not accident books come out. It's not accidental films come out. If you really know the background of things, you'll understand. 
So this whole idea of nationalizing Malcolm X to create a different discussion away from the logical discussion that African people are, need to get into is part of the game going on. So here at Sankova, what we did was, we called it, what is, who, you know, who is Malcolm to me, is to repossess, to repossess Malcolm X. I remember one African American, you know, not a professor, he came out of the movie of Malcolm X from Spike Lee and he said, he said, they took Malcolm away from me. They're gone. They took him from me. What he meant for me there was how much they simplified into like a Broadway show Malcolm's life. Mm -hmm. You would never see Kennedy's life like the like Broadway life. show. So the point here is we are sometimes innocent at the battle of ideas. White supremacy lives a guilt of centuries for what it has done to non-white people. Every war you can think now, if it is not connected to some early places where the booby traps of what we're seeing now going on, we really don't know the game that's going on. So here at Sankova, our idea is we need to possess back Malcolm without being exclusive and rejecting ideas, etc. But in the end, we need to possess Malcolm. So white people who hated him, who hated what he stand, all the CIA agents and imperialists who were planning the killing of his case, you know, the drama, when they staged it. So if you read how they do, how they do kill, just read Blowback, just read uh, uh, the economic uh, hitman, read how they were planning, how they will make you and me act through, through some drug to go kill what we, we didn't even intend. They poisoned Martin Paul Robeson with NLSD in Russia. How did the CIA go to Russia to put in his drink? Okay, I can call names and names for you that they have killed in that period. Kennedy himself was so scared of Malcolm X. You would find all the writings, but we squabble because we have now job seekers, tenure, tenure in, in white universities. It's no more black studies. It's like a single black professor who's always called to speak on the ghetto. Why is there a drum in the ghetto? And the native is explained by one professor. In time like this, we better begin to nationalize and possess our own history with all its dimensions. Thank you for coming. Please support our struggle.